Alrighty, so just to introduce you guys to this series, my name is Ashlyn. I know it says Rosie Couture, but I'm on our executive director's account, that's why. I am one of the national co-outreach directors of Generation Ratify, and this is the fourth installment of our A Seat at the Table series, which is aiming to educate people on various career paths that relate to social justice and advocacy. And this one's going to focus on campaign work, and we are so excited about this webinar and everything that we can share. So what I want to encourage all of you to do is during the webinar, if you have any questions that come up, feel free to drop them in the chat. Those will be prioritized over our pre-written questions. So feel free to ask anything in there. And yeah, just to get started, Mary Lou, if you wanna introduce yourself and the work that you do. Sure, yeah, so it's nice to meet you all. Um, my name is Mary Lou Kai Ferguson. As Ashan mentioned, we met um, in 2018, actually on my first campaign. Um, I don't know if you know that, but um, to give a little background about myself, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I grew up in what used to be the most diverse square mile in America, um, Clarkston, which is in East Atlanta. And I think we got overtaken by Queens, but um, I spent my life growing up around people from all different backgrounds. Um, and I, that really informed for me why it's so important to get involved in politics. Um, I saw that when people were empowered to be part of leadership, um, the decisions that were being made were, were changed because the people who are affected are starting to get a seat at the table and drive the policies and drive the things that, that really affect people's everyday instead of just a, a few wealthy or you know well-connected people being at the top making these decisions that don't even affect them. So um, that's kind of generally why I've always been interested in politics, interested in social justice. Um, after I went to college, I actually became a teacher. I always wanted to be a teacher growing up. So I taught high school for a few years. Um, it was actually funny. I, my youngest brother is 18. And so I was teaching his exact age as they got older. Um, and so dealing with him at home and then also at, at school. Um, but I think something that really affected me there was seeing how at the school board level, people were making decisions that really affected my students and they had no power over it. And oftentimes it'd really be a make or break and whether a student had the ability to pass or fail a class, even if they were working the, their hardest. Um, this is a one very specific example, but I just remember they cut off the buses um, for after school tutoring, which I, I used for a lot of my students to just give one-on-one -on -one time, make sure everyone understood the material. And a lot of students, this was in uh, parts of rural Louisiana. So many students lived almost up to, up to an hour away. Sometimes they didn't have transportation. Um, no one could drive back and forth from school. And so because of this arbitrary policy that was set in place by this random leader um, in the school board, my, many of my students were no longer able to get that one-on-one -on -one attention that they needed in order to pass the class, um, in order to pass the, the testing, in order to pass ninth grade, in order to graduate high school. And so I think that really irked me. Um, it made me feel that as, as much as I did in my classroom, there, if we didn't have leadership that understood what we needed and leadership that understood how people succeed, um, it, it, it almost felt like moot because I could, I could teach a killer lesson and all my students could walk away knowing how to graph a parabola. Um, but then if, if the government, if the school board, if the structures that were set in place weren't setting up my students to succeed, there were so many things that were out of my control. So I um, ended up applying for fellowship in education policy. I packed my bags. I moved to DC, hoping I would get a job after. Um, so I did a fellowship. I started working in Asian American outreach um, and education work. And then after, after that ended, I just honestly was looking for a job to hold me over to pay rent until I found like a real education job. And so I got a job on the Ben Jealous campaign in Maryland. Um, he ran for governor in 2018. And I start. I worked with him as a regional organizing director. That's where I met Ashlyn. Um, and I covered two counties, Montgomery County and Anne Arundel County. And I was both the organizing director and the political director. Um, so this was my first campaign job. So I had no idea what I was stepping into. I was like, if I hate it, it's only three months long and then I can go on and do education work. Um, but I, I, I ended up falling in love with it. As you can see, I'm still doing this work. Um, so to talk a little bit about the specifics of that role, 
um, for the political side of it. Essentially what I did was I had a master tracker of every single elected official from state ledge um, all the way down to very local school boards, um, local town councils, and made sure that I had built a relationship with each one of those people, um, tracked, I, you know, you make a big spreadsheet and you track how often you communicate with them, see where they're at. The goal is that you want them to endorse, but um, endorsing just by saying I endorse is not that helpful. So you want to think through what are all the things that all the other elected officials can do to support this campaign and to support this movement to get this elected official um, to be the governor. Um, so th the political side is making sure you're talking to all the different elected officials. But um, in addition to that, there are all these different organizations that I consider political, right? Just because um, you're not an elected official doesn't mean you're not a political leader. And so organizations like um, local sunrise movements, local Ashland helped with a lot of the local democratic clubs in the high schools, um, uh, many different activist organizations, political organizations, democratic clubs, um, stuff like that are all considered political. So maintaining relationships, seeing how you can support each other because a lot of these organizations are working together, just like Generation Ratify, working together to achieve a lot of the same goals. So figuring out how we can team up to support each other. And then on the organizing front, um, I'm sure that many of you have somehow e either heard of organizing or been in touch with someone who's been involved in organizing, um, because I, I love seeing that a lot of young people are getting really, really involved in organizing now. Um, so organizing is essentially just making sure that we are talking to as many people as possible. In the past few years, a lot of organizing has changed, specifically under COVID-19, it's changed a lot, um, but we have started leaning more into digital, so being more creative about how do we reach out to folks. Um, and so being the, organi the regional organizing director over the two counties, I checked in with the organizers, I checked in with the coordinated campaign. So each state usually has a Democratic Party coordinated campaign where they coordinate up and down the ballot, all of the different tickets. Um, so they have staff that does, they door knocks for like all the Democratic candidates. Um, so coordinating with those organizers to make sure that we were all on message, that we were, they were um, delivering Ben Jealous's message for the governor's campaign. So I think that's a brief overview of what my responsibilities were there. Um, after that campaign, I was like, okay, I, I actually do kind of like this. Um, and so I, um, I had made I had made many relationships with mentors on that campaign. Um, started with um, one of our senior advisors, and as soon as that campaign ended, he called me the next day and he said, "Okay, just don't get in trouble, don't get arrested between now and mm, February of next year because we're going to do a presidential." And I was like, "Oh, are we now? Okay, <laughs> I didn't realize that was my next job." <laughs> so um, I. Did what he said. I, I walked dogs. I baked a lot of bread. Um, I twiddled my thumbs a lot. I did some knitting, but um, and tutored. Did some odd jobs to pay rent and and waited until February. Um, and we were in between a few different um, presidential candidates, and we ended up working with Elizabeth Warren's campaign. And so when I say we, um, if you do get involved in campaigns, you'll start finding that there are almost um, campaign families. Um, so there are folks who are connected from campaign to campaign. And so um, right now I just hired someone who I worked with on the Warren campaign or who I worked with on the Jealous campaign, um, who's going to be joining me on this next campaign that I'm on. Um, and all of those folks also, there are people who are related who were on the Doug Jones campaign and Ayanna Presley campaign. And so there's usually like a strain of senior advisors who kind of pick people up along the way and becomes this kind of family of people who know each other and um, stay in touch and kind of continue to hire each other or hire their recommendations. And so there are multiple different, once you kind of get into it, you'll see that there are multiple different kind of groups like this um, that are, that have gone from campaign to campaign together. Um, so to talk a little bit about the Warren campaign, I first joined as um, the regional, or I first joined as the organizing director for the Midwest. So I covered nine states across the Midwest, basically everything that touches Iowa, but not Iowa, um, and then a few that are a li little further from Iowa. And my role was to create an organizing program in all of those states while we had no staff. So I was from February of 2019 until um, November of 2019. And what I did there was create a distributed organizing program. So many of you may be familiar with distributed organizing. It's essentially this model 
Um, there's two main models of, of political campaign organizing. One is centralized, one is decentralized or distributed. Um, and so distributed meaning that rather than um, we just ask volunteers to show up to the office and go knock on doors or make phone calls, um, the model is more that we are teaching the volunteers to be their own organizers. So to be um, in charge of the what they think that they need to do to engage people in their neighborhood, what they think the message should be when they're talking to folks, um, creative ways that they can reach out to people. Because ultimately, as I mentioned, I'm from Atlanta, I'm not from the Midwest. So when I show up in Michigan, I can't say these are the things you need to say and these are the things that you need to do to engage people. So what we did do is um, I cultivated we had um, almost 200 different teams across those nine states where um, I worked with folks who became team leaders um, or volunteer leaders and they would build their own organizing teams. So we would check in every two weeks. Um, we would set goals together, how many doors we wanna knock, how many events we wanna have and essentially allowed people to be creative in the way that they talk to folks. And so this was really, really fun. It taught me a lot, probably the most that I've, I've learned on any campaign so far. Um, on, on how to organize because a lot of folks um, were so, so wildly creative in the ideas they came up with. We had people doing um, like babysitting clubs or they, we had um, parents who would bring their kids. They would take turns, half of them would phone bank, half of them would play with the kids and make art in support of the candidate. And then they would swap and the other half would phone bank, the other half would make art. We had people doing bike rides together, people going on runs together. Um, ultimately, people want to spend time together. They want to get to know each other. We want to build a community. And so that means it's, it's more than just doing house parties. It's more than just asking people to knock on doors, but understanding the two or three touches it takes to engage someone before you ask them to volunteer and making sure that they feel welcome, making sure that they know that this is their space. Um, so that's what we did. Um, it was it was a huge scale operation with um, there were only four of us that were covering the whole country outside of the early states. So it was very much um, a, a, a big jump from managing two counties in Maryland to nine states <laughs> in the country. Um, but you'll find that if you do campaign work, the jumps are like it. We say that a year in campaign work is like five years in other work because you just the scale up is really, really fast. Um, so then in November, we started staffing up in all of these states. Um, so I started, I helped with the hiring process to get a state director in Illinois, Michigan, Minnesota, all these big states. Um, and they started hiring organizers. And so as soon as we had staff on the ground, there wasn't really a need for me to continue to manage everything from, from headquarters. Um, so I transitioned to being the AAPI outreach director, um, which was a really cool role. I was both on the political team and on the community engagement team. And this was kind of a continuation of that first work, but instead of doing just the Midwest, I got to do the whole country um, and really focus on, you know, we had, of course, target states, the high, higher API population, um, which stands for Asian American Pacific Islander. Um, sorry, I always blow through that word. Um, but um, I, we, it was really fun, again, to work with people and figure out what we need to do to engage communities that have the lowest turnout rate um, out, of, out of any race in, in the states. So um, again, listening to community leaders, figuring out who those political leaders are, figuring out who those cultural leaders are, elders, having those conversations with them and giving, giving them the lead and having them tell us what we should be doing um, to be reaching out to communities. Um, so doing a lot of translation work, doing a lot of um, meetings with folks. Um, we had a, had the Senator, Senator Warren do a lot of um, calls with people. We did round tables. We rolled out a 50 page policy plan as of course we did <laughs> on, um, on um, a future for API America, which is, um, I would say the most comprehensive any presidential candidate has ever made. I've given it all to the Biden team now we're working together because ultimately I want them to use that platform. I want them to, to continue to, to expand and grow on what they're offering for our community. So um, I think that was kind of like the, the base level of what I did for, for both of those roles. I think um, one of the most amazing parts of working on that campaign was um, I counted at from March 2019 to March 2020, I went to 26 states. Um, so they flew me all over the country. I got to see, I got to go to so many places I've never been to before. But more importantly, I got to talk to people who I'm from communities that I've never engaged with before. Um, so I just clearly being in Duluth, Minnesota, um, and folks coming in their work overalls to from from like the Iron Range. 
um, to our organizing meeting and saying, I voted for Trump, he's not serving me. Um, I wanna see what's next, um, I'm supporting Elizabeth Warren. And so having these conversations with people who are so disillusioned with leadership, um, be inspired and want to get back in it and want to, want to get involved was so, so exciting. And it was also really exciting to spend time, especially in the Midwest with a lot of people who said that they voted for Trump and are ready for something new. So that was definitely something that was inspiring for me. Um, so then I finished that. I was so burnt out because <laughs> I was just a lot of one way tickets. I didn't know where I was going next. Um, when we dropped out, my next assignment was actually to be the organizing director of Hawaii, which is very sad. I never got to go. <laughs> um, but I made a promise to myself. I was like, I'm um, exhausted. I'm going to take a break from this. I am only gonna work for a really cool progressive woman of color at like a city level or a local level um, because I feel like that's where I really want to put in work to make change. Um, but other than that, I'm, I'm just gonna tap out for now. And then of course, like two days after <laughs> we, I made that decision and we wrapped, I think we dropped out on a, a Thursday. Um, we had our end of the campaign party on a Friday. And then that Monday, um, I got a call from Michelle Wu, who is a, a city councilor in Boston. And um, she asked me to come onto her team. And I was like, you know what? This, the promise that I made was this. So I took like two weeks off and have been with her since April. Um, she's currently a city councilor, but we're working on some exciting stuff. Um, so stay tuned over the next uh, few weeks. And um, I've been managing basically that I've transitioned now to doing um, campaign manager role. So um, learning all the different pieces of the campaign that I had never engaged in before. Um, so like digital fundraising, comms, research, um, and getting a little slice of everything. And it was really helpful to me to be able to do the scale of a presidential campaign and understand all the different pieces that exist in order to then bring it back home um, and do the tiny slices of it for, for a more local one. So. That's where I'm at now. Um, I hope that was what you were <laughs> looking for, um, but happy to have open a conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for that overview. I think that's amazing, everything that you've been doing um, and getting all of those experiences. And I think my first question coming off of that um, is what skills do you think are most valuable in campaign work? Because especially since campaigns, it seems like you jump around from a lot of different campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I guess in addition to being very adaptable, what skills do you think you've seen around people that you think are successful in campaign work and then in yourself that you either have innately or have developed by being on campaigns? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think in terms of soft skills, I think it's really important to, I guess it depends on the on the roles you do. Um, the roles that I do is, have always been really people oriented. And so, um, you know, if you want to go into the data side or research side where you're really just doing your thing and focusing, I don't know if this will this will necessarily translate. But at least for my my side of campaign work, it's really important that you know how to listen to people, you know how to work with people, um, you know how to value people. I think that um, one of the things that I struggled with a lot in campaigns is the the higher up you move in the in the ranks of campaigns, the less face time you get with people on the ground, um, listening to people's stories, understanding what it is. Um, that people need change for in their lives. And I think that is really key is, is if every campaign can continue to hold on to who we're serving, why we're doing this and and who we're working with, um, I think we'll all be better. Um, in terms of, and I, I think another one is um, working under pressure and being able to make fast decisions. So um, Travis, who is one of my mentors and was the campaign manager for the Jealous campaign, um, when I first came on and every single day he would reiterate um, that speed is a weapon. So being able to make fast decisions, being able to trust your gut, um, that you know, if you have something that you have, if you can make a decision within five minutes rather than mulling it over for three hours, you might beat the other candidates and releasing that press press release or being the first one to, to say that you're in support of something. Um, and so it, it is it is really important to be able to be fast, be confident in those decision making skills, and you're going to mess up and that's okay and being all right with it. Um, there's also a lot of really high pressure situations. And so, um, I don't want to say don't be stressed because everyone's going to be stressed. It's going to happen, but understanding yourself well enough that you know how to deal with that. So if that's, you know, you need to go tech free and go camping for a weekend to reset and be able to hit the ground running again, do that. If it means that you need to meditate or maybe you need to go on a run or maybe you need to go out with friends one night, just understanding what recharges you and making sure you don't forget to take care of you first. Otherwise you're going to burn out before you reach the end. 
Um, do you want to hear about so hard skills? Is that helpful or? Yeah, sure. I think that could be helpful. Um, awesome. So I think like in, in terms of hard skills, if you're looking to jump into a campaign, um, NGP is the database that every almost every Democratic candidate uses. Um, and so understanding some basics of NGP, I see that you guys are actually already using it because your sign up form looks like it's in every action. Um, and so just understanding the basics of that, you can go to, I think you can just go to their website and even watch one of their webinars to look what, see what the interface looks like. Um, and then it, I think it's really important to have done phone banking and door knocking yourself even if you want to do like comms or if you want to do political or, or something that's not organizing, I think everyone needs to understand what that experience is like. Otherwise, you're making decisions for others who are knocking on doors and doing that, that big lift of talking to people on the ground without knowing what that is like. Thank you so much. I think that is some really good advice. And then I think my next question then is how can young people become involved in campaigns? Because I, what I've seen, at least in the campaigns that I've been involved in, is that it's usually on the ground and young people are the ones doing that face-to-face -face contact. So what are some ways that people can become plugged into campaigns? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that sometimes the weird thing about campaigns is that it can feel like a black hole of getting in touch with people. You go to their website and there like, might not even be a form or there's like info at and you're like, no one's checking this. Um, so I think just being persistent in um, f finding your way in, um, whatever that is, emailing, calling, going to their website, filling out whatever forms you can find, um, but figuring out a way that you can get looped in. Um, I think by just showing up, I think the, the easiest um, entryway is through organizing. So just showing up to those phone banks, showing up to those door knocks. And then if you do want to get involved in other spaces, um, just just say it, you know, I think it's always worth it to shoot your shot. Every campaign is short staffed. We always need more people. And so if you can just offer help, sometimes it's so hassled and so short staffed that if you just say like, I want to help in comms, it can feel really vague. It feels like work um, for the staffer to create work for you. Um, so if you have an idea of exactly what you want to do, um, go to the, go to a staffer or go to whoever your contact is and say, I want to organize an event where I bring together um, young people and have the candidate come speak. I can bring a room of 50 people and then we can all sign up forms and, or we can do a Q and A or, you know, offer up. I want to help with research. Um, I've, I'm, I've been doing some research on, on how you do fact checking and I would love to be one of the interns that does fact checking or whatever it is. So if you have something specific um, rather than just saying comms or organizing or political, I think that'll make it a lot easier um, for them to assign you something. And I think my next question then is um, when you were getting your start in campaigning, was there any expectations that you had going into it that were either met or maybe challenged? And maybe how has your perception of campaign work changed over time? Hmm. I think that's a really good question. So I think that um, one thing that I expected, I think from all the movies that I've seen and in TV, is that it would be a crazy, awful work environment um, where everything is flying and no one's really taking care of management. I think that, I obviously don't wanna say that's true for every campaign, but I think that there is a hole in the campaign world of um, having people that have been there for a long time and have learned how to manage because right now, the, the way that the system is set up is that they just work you and work you and work you until you're like, okay, I'm going to tap out and be a consultant, or I'm going to tap out and start a different career or whatever that is. And so even in the Warren office sitting in there, you know, most people were in their 20s and 30s, um, and maybe like a handful of folks were like above the age of 40, which, you know, when you're sitting there, you're like, that's actually really crazy that <laughs> um, it's all run by young people. And I think this is across the board in all, I don't know about the Trump campaign or Republican campaigns, but in most democratic campaigns, it's like this. And so I think that was surprising to me. Um, and I can see that campaigns now, even in the few years that I've been involved, are working really hard to build strong cultures to make sure that people are able to take care of themselves, people are able to live a sustainable lifestyle, but it's just, you're sprinting to a finish line in everything that you do. It's just the nature of what a campaign is. And so I think that's always gonna be a little bit of a part of it. 
um, I think something that surprised me was when I first started, um, the first campaign that I was on had a lot of men. Um, and it was really, you know, it, 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 that, it, it matched the stereotype that I had in my head of politics being lots of fratty men um, calling all the shots. And I think the more time that I spent in that campaign, I understood kind of how that was built and really it was, it was part of a hiring thing. And it was, um, you know, who we bring to the table to make decisions. Um, and I've seen since then campaigns being much more intentional um, in how they're hiring and how they create space for people to have their opinions heard to feel valued to feel important as a woman of color i felt a little weird coming in especially feeling like i didn't know what i was doing um joining my first campaign and as a mid-level um staffer and i think just building that confidence but then also joining campaigns that create that space that are majority people of color that are majority women um or non-binary folks um really showed me that it it's possible it just has to be intentional and has to be built and so in your position, um, I think something that I'm interested in is when you are able to bring people into the team, um, what is that process like? And maybe how do you try to be intentional with how you're bringing people onto the campaign to make sure that a variety of voices are being represented? Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm in the hiring phase right now. So that's actually something that I'm constantly thinking about and asking myself. I think first is understanding the unintentional biases that we build when we just look at resumes and cover letters when we're hiring people. Um, something that comes to mind often is how people oftentimes equate elite universities or even a college education with the ability to do campaign work. I think that for most roles, that's actually not the case at all. Um, my, one of my closest coworkers and closest friends did, didn't have a college degree on the Warren campaign and was like one of the stars of the campaign. It just, it, you know, sometimes it just doesn't, doesn't add up one to one. So I think that understanding what resumes and applications make the first pass and why we do that is really important to just take a step back and reflect that and who has access to getting those um getting those unpaid internships getting into these colleges um and and why people might have a more padded resume than others um, and i think it's also really important to as much as possible interview as many people as you can um, because again on paper, it's so hard to compare people because you just don't know much about their story, who they are, what they care about, but actually giving people a chance and talking to them and understanding um, what everyone brings to the table experience-wise, diversity of thought-wise, um, and making sure you're building your team intentionally to have a wide variety. And what does a typical work day or week look like for you? And maybe how has that changed uh, due to COVID and adjusting the campaign to being primarily virtual? Ooh, it looks completely different, <laughs> like 100% different. Um, so my dad calls it living at work rather than working from home, which is awful. Um, but Right now, my average day would be I wake up and I try my hardest to not look at any email until I have like walked the dog and done my own thinking so I don't get immediately inundated with what I have to do. Um, and I have weekly priorities that I set for myself every Monday or sometimes Friday evenings um, to make sure that I don't get stuck in the daily to do's. So especially with campaign work, cause it moves so quickly, there are so many things that come at you. Um, so just making sure we, I have an idea of what those broader goals are. Um, I actually like to block off my time. So I'm like two to four, I'm working on this um, press release and I'm not gonna do anything else. 12 to two, I'm gonna make call times to these folks. So um, just chunking things out on Monday. And so every single day looks different. I think what's exciting, what I love about this role is I am, really in charge of myself. I actually, I, in the past few roles that I've had, and so I think maybe in a lot of campaign roles, it depends on your leadership, but you really get to set your day to day. I just feel so much dread at the idea of being stuck in a nine to five and like having to wake up at the same time every day and do the exact same thing. And so one of the reasons why I like this is because, you know, if I wanna do this, I'm gonna do this right now. If I wanna do it at two in the morning and wake up at noon, like I can do that as long as I figured out my schedule and um, done what I need to do. I think in to, to explain a much more exciting uh, day in the life or week in the life, um, when I was in the Warren campaign, 
Um, I was in the last like few weeks I did, I did a month in Nevada. And so it, a week in the life there would look like I would figure out what are the, what are the communities that I want to reach out to this week? How am I going to reach out to them? Um, what are the press interviews that I want to do on behalf of the candidate? Um, what are materials that we need to be making? And then just building that out for myself and then zipping around uh, Las Vegas and kind of just again, doing my own thing. And that is that was just so, so fun and exciting to me, was being able to just have a place, have a task at hand and just build out exactly how I did that myself. And like you mentioned earlier, there are kind of these campaign families where people will kind of bring each other in and then maintain those connections throughout a variety of campaigns. So I'm wondering if you have any tips for young people who may be getting started in campaigns, maybe interning while they're in college or high school, how they may be able to maintain connections on campaigns and then hopefully come back to that kind of same group of people campaigning in the future when they have time to do something full time. Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, I think, as you may have noticed, I, I haven't actually applied for a job since 2018, um, since that first job that I got on the Jealous campaign. I've just been asked to come places or I've been brought with, with mentors. Um, and so once you kind of establish that family, it is so, so, so helpful, um, especially because it starts to expand your network. If there's somewhere where you do want to apply, you just go through, you know, ask the people that you know, and they'll get you there. So I think in order to kind of be a part of, and, and these aren't like real, entities, I just made up that word family. So it's not this like cool mafia thing. It's just like a network of mentors. <laughs> um, but I, I would say always shoot your shot with um, folks who are uh, uh, higher than you. So the campaign manager, maybe the political director, um, anyone whose job you're interested in or who you're interested in as a person and just ask them for coffee or ask if you can chat with them, ask if you can shadow them, whatever it is and try to build a relationship with them. You know, they might be crazy busy and it might feel like you're not getting through to them. But Ashlyn is the only, I think I had like 11 interns at one point on that team and Ashlyn's the only one that, or Ashlyn and one other person are the only two that I've, that I've stayed in touch with um, and who I remember their names and I, keep, and I know what they're doing right now and I keep tabs on them. And that's because they kept showing up. Um, Ashlyn even, I came to one thing where she was, I think the only volunteer that showed up and we just hung out together all day. Um, so just continuing to show up and being persistent and honestly being a little bit annoying and just like being there, being there, being there, and they'll remember you, you'll start to build that relationship. Um, and then, you know, people want to talk about themselves, they want to talk about what they've done, they want to talk about how they can help you. And so just continue to ask for help. It's definitely um, an industry where you should be asking for help, because no one really knows what they're doing. As I said, everyone in the presidential campaign office is like in their 20s and 30s. And so we're just constantly asking for help from, from our mentors. And um, it's kind of a normalized part of it. And um, I think my next question then is, what was the largest learning curve of being on the presidential campaign? Um, and I, maybe just being on a campaign in general, like when you started on the Jealous campaign, maybe what transitioning into that role and being on a campaign for the first time, what your kind of biggest adjustment was? Yeah, I think the first big adjustment was realizing that I had broad goals set for me but no steps to fill in how to get there. So um, one of the first things I said was, okay, welcome to the Jealous Campaign. Um, we wanna get the endorsements from all 32 state legislators in Montgomery County. Um, can you make that happen? And I was like, how, <laughs> like, what do I do? Um, and like I said, like you just ask questions until you figure it out. Everyone's faking it. So just find those people you trust and ask them what you should be doing. Um, and so really realizing that I think that was my first panic thing was just not, you know, understanding point A and point B, but nothing about what goes in the middle. Um, and I'm doing that again in my, at my current job, right? I have, there are so many things that I don't understand about the middle, but I'm just constantly calling people um, and past mentors and being like, okay, like, how do, how do I know what comms consultant to get? Like, what's a pollster even do? <laughs> um, and just asking these questions. Um, and I think now I realize that that's actually one of my favorite parts of this job is being able to fill in that middle yourself. Because um, when you're at like an office job, you know, it depends on your manager, but I've been, I've, I've been in places where they micromanage every single step of what you do. But they're like, write this email draft, um, run it by me, make my edits, whatever, whatever. Um, whereas in campaign world, it's like, okay, just get it done. You have, you have two weeks, like you'll figure it out. Um, 
I think in terms of the presidential, like I mentioned earlier, um, just being told I have nine states in the Midwest or I've only been to, to two of them. And that was just very like for weekends, I was like, I, I don't know anything about North Dakota. <laughs> like, I, I, I don't know how to start this. I don't know people there, like, what do I do? Um, and so again, just being thrown into it and being told I can figure it out and then building that confidence to see that like I did figure it out. And um, as long as you ask questions, like you'll be able to figure it out. And um, my next question then is, is there anything that you wish you had known before starting on either of those campaigns um, or anything that maybe you wish you could have told your past self as we're getting into these roles? Yeah, I think um, something that I wish I had known is that everyone brings different abilities to the table. And so even if you don't feel like you're able to do the task at hand, even if it feels gigantic and you are not prepared at all, um, there's a reason why someone put you there. There, you know, campaigns are really competitive to get a job on. And so there's a reason that someone hired you or someone brought you on as an intern or as a team member and asked you to do something. It's because they trusted that you can do it and they believe in you. And so it's okay to fail. It's okay to mess up and you're going to. Um, but just to, I, I wish that I had known to be confident and, and I was there for a reason. I was there because someone thought I could do it. And is there any specific type of campaign work that maybe you recommend for people who are just getting their start in campaigning? And I mean, probably one kind of given is organizing, but anything else that maybe young people aren't as familiar with, but the opportunities are there for them to kind of explore. Yeah, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head with organizing. I think it's so, so important that everyone does organizing. Um, because even if you do become like a comms director, you need to know what that message is going to be like when you have a 16 year old knocking on the door and, and reiterating that message and what that's going to be like for them. And so I think, it, like you said, organizing is so, so important. I think for all the other facets, when you're on a local campaign, it's often like two or three people who are doing everything. And so it really depends on what you're interested in. You can pretty easily slot in with a presidential campaign. It's like a thousand people and everything. Everyone has like one specific slice. Like one person is just buying Facebook ads and one person is just checking the Twitter DMs. Um, and so in, in that sense, it's also like just just so, so much. Um, so I think if you get involved in a local campaign, just see see what your interests are and just try to slot in. I think it's, you know, there's a wide variety. I think that comms are, is something that people find to be really glamorous. Um, I don't know why, um, but I think maybe like the messaging part of it. So I think if that's really interesting to you, offering up your, your help to be just fact check or to um, be a copywriter or whatever it is, um, so you can see what that's like. But I think there's so many different parts of the campaign that we don't really hear about unless you're inside of it. So once you're in there, like seeing what people are actually doing with their days, what interests you and being like, how, how can I help with a little slice of that? And how has campaigning for you changed or shaped maybe your future pursuits, whether it be jobs or where you want to live or just kind of in general, how do you think your time campaigning over the past two years has shaped what you want to do in the future? Hmm, that's a great question that I do not have an answer to yet. I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> I think that what it has shown me is I was really thinking about going to grad school um, and now I'm starting to do a decent amount of policy work in my current role as we work on like rollouts um, and in my end with the Warren campaign. And I realized that there are a lot of things that you can learn on the job, even in campaign roles that I could have also paid like a hundred thousand dollars for. And so <laughs> I'm kind of thinking through like, if that's still an, if that's still something that I want to do. Um, but I think that what it's shown me is that I, when I first moved to DC, um, someone told me that I just the way that it goes is if I want to be in politics, I have to go work on the hill. I have to be at the very bottom rung of the ladder for a year and then move up another rung for another year and then move up another rung for another year. And in that time, I've already jumped like five years of career levels in in campaign time. And so, you know, working on the hill is awesome. And if that's for you, I think you should totally do it. But I think there's also when you work in campaigns, you can just the amount of responsibility that you can hold just 
leaps and bounds ahead of many other um, roles in this world. And so I think for me, my eyes have just opened up. I'm like, how do I at this point then just, how, am I, how can I be in charge of myself? And so I'm just building towards, um, how can I make decisions moving forward where I'm just doing what I want to do instead of just moving from job to job. And for people watching who maybe have not worked on a campaign before, could you kind of quickly break down maybe what the key positions are on a campaign um, that maybe they should be familiar with and be able to identify if they're trying to maybe get started as like an intern or just a volunteer? Yeah, so I think probably for your average like um, gubernatorial or Congress race, um, so probably like a, like a house race or like a statewide race um, would have a campaign manager. There's usually um, a few different senior advisors um, that do various roles. There's a comms director and they basically hone the message for the candidate um, and make sure that that message is integrated into every single platform that's, that is used. Um, so whether that's press, um, earned media, which is basically um, free media. So when you, when you make a statement or when people come to cover you and then paid media is when you pay to be on media. So that's like ads, um, digital ads, TV ads. Um, there's the organizing department, the organizing director, and then the regional organizing directors, and then the organizers below that. Um, there's the political director who does the political work of talking to organizations, elected officials. Um, there's a scheduler, um, who, does all the scheduling, which sounds like not that hard of a job, but it is one of the hardest jobs um, in politics and campaign world because you're packing every single minute, you're calculating drive times, you're calculating meal times, like every single minute of, of the candidate's time is, is uh, measured out days in advance. Um, there is a press secretary, so they manage the, the media, so they have their relationships with reporters and just manage that whole process. So they, they're less about the voice, but just making you know when we're going to be on TV, when we're going to be on radio, and managing that whole process. Um, there's research, so they do all the fact checking. They make sure that we're not saying anything fake. They make sure that our opposition is not saying anything fake. Um, they do self research, so make sure that um, we know about any potential scandals and are not surprised and are prepared for that. Um, and then I feel like I'm probably missing something. Oh, finance. Um, the finance director does all the fundraising. They build out the budget for, you know, so probably like one to $3 million, mostly for a house race. Um, and how are you gonna get every single one of those dollars? So are you gonna get it through online fundraising, through digital fundraising? Are you gonna have an emails program where you, I don't know if anyone signed up for any emails, um, but you probably get a lot of spam messages like asking you for money, like that sort of thing. Um, hosting fundraisers, doing call time where the where the candidate sits and just calls donors and asks for money. Um, and so that team is usually pretty big. There's finance director and finance assistants, sometimes a deputy. Um, and I think, and then there's an ops, sometimes a body person who follows the candidate around and just make sure that the candidate doesn't have to think about anything, just show up, speak, you know, I have the memo, this is what I do go here, call this person, I have this memo, this is what I do. So they just do all the driving and make sure they have all the things they need. Um, and I think that's mostly, I'm definitely missing something, but that, I think that's mostly it. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for that rundown. And um, as we're getting close to five, I wanna quickly plug for everybody that is watching the next two installments that we have of this series. We have two more questions that we're going to ask Mary Lou. Um, but our next installment is going to be next Wednesday. It's on political communication with the communications officer of Equality Now. And then the Wednesday after that, we're going to be having a panel of women who have founded a variety of organizations, including the founder of Generation Ratify, the founder of Not My Generation, and the founder of the Greater Good Initiative. And I will plug the links to sign up for those in the chat if any of you are interested. Um, and that will conclude this series. So. Now that we are getting close to five, um, I think my second to last question is what has been the most challenging part of campaigning for you? Um, and how do you think maybe you've learned to adjust to that? I think the most challenging part is make like holding the reins onto my own personal life while doing campaign work. Um, I think like I've mentioned a few times, it's just, 
all day, very intense work. Um, and it always feels like a sprint. And when you're on a campaign for a long time, it feels like you're sprinting for a year. Um, so just making sure that you know how to take care of yourself. Um, I think that's something that I had to very actively learn on the Warren campaign. I would start um, every Sunday, I like to make a list of like all the things that I'm going to do this week that will make me feel happy and make me feel like I'm taking care of myself. And it can be really silly, like, um, take my dog to training class this week or um, like make sure that I, I paint something or make myself coffee and go for a walk for like two mornings this week. Um, but just things to make sure that I am taking care of myself because it can just feel all consuming. It can feel like the most urgent thing in the world. But when I wasn't taking care of myself, when I was burning out, which I did in multiple phases throughout the presidential, um, I wasn't able to do that work because I was just so fried. So it's definitely been a learning curve and um, understanding just what what I need. And that's going to be different for everyone else. For some people, it's like going out and just like raging and partying all night. And I think like that's also very valid too. Just like whatever you need to do and figuring that out. And then I think my last question, which is pretty broad, is what has been the most rewarding part of campaigning for you? Oof. Well, I haven't yet had a win. <laughs> I think that would be great. Um, <laughs> um, the most rewarding part has been the incredible people that I've met along the way. I've made so many dear, dear friends um, from this process, people from all over the country, um, people who come from all different backgrounds and schools of thought. And that has just been so exciting to me. And I always learn the most when I'm with people who are different from myself um, in every every means of the word. And so I've just learned a lot about all, you know, there's so many movements in this country. There are so many things that people are working on and hearing about people's specific passions, the projects that they've been working on, the organizations they've been building and just getting to know, know them as people and getting to know their work has been so, so, so awesome. And then do you have any final resources or tips that you would like to share with people that are watching and also anybody that's watching, if you have any questions that you would like to ask, feel free to submit them in the chat. Yeah, um, so in terms of resources, I'm going to put my email address in the chat. Um, feel free to email me. That's my personal and it's a horrible place right now, this inbox, so if I don't respond, just be persistent, just email, like bump it, <laughs> email me again, and I promise I will eventually see it. It's not because I'm ignoring you. Um, but I would love to be in touch if anyone wants to chat about anything further. I think, um, like I said before, if you are interested in being on a campaign, just showing up as something, um, find a candidate that's local to you. I think right now it's so tough because everything is virtual, but I've seen a lot of candidates do really cool virtual events so people can still meet each other and see each other and just jump in there. Like you are qualified to do it. Um, every single person is qualified to help on a campaign. Just, just get your foot in the door and start making calls, start talking to people. Um, and if you're not sure how to do that, if you feel free to email me and let me know where you live or what campaign you want to get involved in and I will try to help you um, get involved. Alrighty, so unless anybody has any questions, I know that it's, we have a couple minutes left, but we can kind of wind down now. So Mary Lou, thank you so much for your time today. Um, it's been so great hearing from you and getting to kind of pick your brain and all the wisdom that you have about campaigning. Um, for everybody that is watching, I highly encourage you to email her and ask for advice because she is such an amazing resource and just person to know. So definitely utilize it. Um, and there will be a recording of this if you ever want to look back on it. So with that, I think we can end. Everybody have a wonderful rest of your day. And hopefully I will see you guys at the next installments of this series. Bye, everyone. Thank you. So Thank glad you guys made it.